We're going live. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel. And our panel, the title is Innovation Risk Outstrips Regulator Progress. And he, today, due to unforeseen circumstances, um, but we're blessed. Now we have Emma, who is the one and only speaker. Um, so we're going to talk to Emma about how she, as an early stage investor, views this topic of innovation versus regulatory risk. And um, we will learn from her because she has had a long and illustrious career um, in the tech industry and now is an angel investor and also a VC. So this should be very exciting for everyone who's interested in hearing about um, what VC thinks about innovation and the impact on society and whether regulatory risks um, are something that they worry about. Yeah, so um, let's begin there and ask Emma to introduce herself and uh, her background. Um, how did you become a VC? What is the story? Uh, thank you very much. Delighted to be uh, on this panel and thank you for the invitation, Angela, and uh, uh, my uh, colleague and friend, uh, Frank. Uh, I started my career as actually as an entrepreneur, uh, as a professor, as a scientist, uh, then I moved on to management consulting. So I've been uh, in uh, management consulting, large transformational pro uh, projects, business and technology, mergers and acquisitions, and divestitures. Uh, I was with uh, Ernst & Young uh, and also later on uh, at the Accenture as well. Uh, and what I learned, which you get with a global uh, with a global presence of so many companies and countries, different sizes, I will have top 40 banks, insurance companies, and also some small size companies. Uh, what I learned is uh, technology has become one of the driving forces uh, enabler. Uh, and uh, technology is now everywhere, regardless of a technology, uh, regardless of an industry or a company. Uh, and we live in digital era. Uh, for that reason, I joined recently, like three years ago, uh, Singularity University. I admire their exponential growth theme and aligning that with the, all of the requirements in regulations, compliance, also the innovation uh, and uh, like what I'm taking away and took away from that methodology is in the digital era that we live, everything is getting digitized. And once any information uh, is digitized, it goes through an exponential growth. We want to recognize it. We want to put it into our strategy growth. We want to put it into our B2B or B2C uh, growth strategy. The digital economy is here. It is um, a reality, and the companies that f grew faster, they actually learned that quickly, and then they leveraged that power. That's actually, it's a very positive thing instead of thinking it's a negative. Uh, so with that, um, I then grew uh, my experience into what can I do for this innovation and established my company, uh, which is Orion Worldwide Innovations, and then I quickly I learned that partnership is make is is more powerful and i partnered with uh, uh, my founding partners established baj accelerator that is playing as a fund as a vc and also as an accelerator program for startups oh that's wonderful and uh, would you tell us more about the ex different experiences of um digital information what do you mean by digital information uh, so there is a chart, actually, if people can uh, just uh, Google 6D exponential growth. It shows uh, the Singularity University methodology that uh, it's a steps from starting from digitizing the information in any oh. industry that could be in healthcare, uh, that could be in the film industry. That was the one that started with the codec with actually photos that uh, became digitized and it created the transformation, uh, the complete transformation from one way of doing business to another. And that uh, created uh, new opportunities and dematerializing and demonetizing some uh, services that we used to have and touch. Now mm -hmm. we don't touch. 
A simple example is a digitized photo is in a, each phone now as a camera. So uh, that is the digitized version of a photo. And you can tell the exponential opportunity, how many places you can put your photo and make it available. Uh, the availability, accessibility becomes highly, highly exponentialized. And then uh, eventually it becomes democratized. So with the digit, any information that becomes digitized in any industry, like I said, currently, uh, imagine it or not, our body, the human body is being digitized. We heard about the CRISPR. Uh, it's only possible that you actually, uh, I know you heard, you're probably working on it. <laughs> So uh, CRISPR has digitized our body. And when, with that digitization, you actually have more access to, uh, to apply uh, formulas, to apply information and make quick, quick decisions, faster decisions, and also makes it possible uh, that data to manipulate uh, the positive way, to change it as we wish. So with that, that's the healthcare example of digitization. And the democratization is the solution becomes readily available and in, in many cases, 99% becomes free for access. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the perfect example of, I'm going to just go back to the photo industry that it, first it became digitized in the, in the camera. Uh, and then the camera became part of the phone. And then phone, when you buy it, it's already dematerialized that you don't touch camera anymore. You just use it through the phone. So those are the examples of, and dematerialization means you don't touch it anymore. It's somewhere digitized, the software version. And the demonetization is you don't pay separately anymore. You don't buy that product. And then with that availability, it becomes available to anybody. So it's democratized. There is no limited access to it. Uh, so that's what the, uh, the digital economy takes us faster. Once it's digitized and once some solutions are applied to it, then it starts growing faster. Uh, so that's the speed of the growth and innovation. And on top of it, why is it so easily to spread? Because we have now close to 7.8, different numbers, 7.9 billion people on this planet and with those numbers, we know that, again, some numbers, 4.7, 4, 4, 4.8 billion people somehow are connected to Internet, some, somehow are connected electronically and with their digitized devices. That means if you have something to offer, you may touch 1 billion people easily if you plan to even reach out to them. And, of course, Google and uh, other uh, organizations, they sell some services for the SEOs and uh, making it uh, the top website. So there are also some tools to make your product even more visible with different uh, search tools and so forth. So it became really sophisticated at the same time, very simple. So the access is there, the growth is there. And now uh, hopefully follow on questions could be how the CEOs uh, <laughs> try to respond to this. Yeah, we will eventually get to that question. But first of all, since it's a panel about regulatory risks for um, a startup company doing innovation. So as an early stage investor yourself, do you prefer to actually look for companies that are in a highly regulated industry, just like mine, which is biotech and pharmaceutical industry, highly regulated? Or do you prefer to look for uh, companies that are in a non-regulatory heavy industry. Um, that that's uh, multiple side uh, type uh, answers I can give. So uh, as an investor, as uh, I'm an actual angel investor, on top of it, uh, we're running this fund. Uh, so as as an investor, I'll just be a very uh, generic investor. Uh, we are looking for uh, companies. Uh, that are not heavily regulated because that slows down the growth. However, there are two sides of this. There are products and industries that are creating social impact. So social impact companies most likely will be regulated because they are touching some areas that are regulated because it has a social impact. Healthcare is an example. Uh, this uh, 
energy is also another one. Uh, then when you touch, there are so many regulations. Uh, export and import regulations are also on top of it if you try to do that global. So a regulated industry makes it harder for investors to plan for growth. The same thing is for CEOs. However, if the social impact is attached to that company theme or a growth plan, uh, there are a group of investors. Uh, we call them single family offices or multifamily offices. Uh, we even have that understanding that for those investors, number one priority is social impact. If there is a social impact, they are interested to consider to invest. If it's not, they, they try to look for the ones that are. So that type of an investor is the target for companies that have social impact plus highly regulated solution. Uh, and when we have that kind of um, company, we actually invite those uh, multifamily or single family offices to participate, uh, to look into that company. Now, why they are trying to do that, they understand that the regular VCs or micro VCs or angels or angel syndicates, uh, they want faster growing companies to actually bring their money back faster. Uh, there is no harm, there is no uh, any, any wrongdoing with this uh, thesis. However, that's what they created these companies, multifamily offices, that they have the capital, they put it in a place where social impact needs that kind of an investment. So they have the patience also for many, multiple years to wait until and support and wait until they get the regulatory certificates or requirements met to be able to go to market. So while we think uh, it's impossible to get that attention, uh, it is more important to identify who are the investors that would put the social impact uh, first. Now, there are also third type of companies. They are highly regulated, but the social impact is really hard to explain or hard to pinpoint and hard to sell. For those CEOs, uh, I would say they need to find that niche find that value that they bring to the society somehow uh, and uh, be able to get very um, specialized investors who are interested in that unique or very specific or highly regulated industry. So there are some group of investors that are uh, investing in very specific uh, areas, knowing that they are highly regulated, but their plan is to wait, actually invest and wait. So they're uh, growth plans are long term and they are OK to uh, grow with the company and help them uh, to get their certifications or regulations. Great. Thank you um, for the different categories. And uh, next question would be about timing. So if if a company is doing innovation in a regulated industry, such as biotech or pharma or other types of um um, environmental um, regulations. Um, what is an appropriate time for an early stage investor to develop some sort of awareness um, for the founding team or early stage team? Um, you know, just regarding regulatory pros and cons that is, you know, very obvious for everyone in the industry, either as a partner or as a client. My answer will be both the CEO and the team and the investor would need to look into it from day one. They need to understand uh, the product that they are building will require some uh, control over it because it's in the area that requires uh, some better attention uh, and mistakes cannot be made because the, uh, the hurt, hurtful part or the wrongdoing may be in a high cost to pay later. That is also a good protection for the CEO itself and an investor. Uh, so if they know they're walking into a regulatory territory, uh, by all means, all their product development, testing, mm -hmm. uh, reaching out to first customers, the pilot, it's all gonna be related to are they touching the existing regulation, and if yes, why? In some cases, it's an old regulation, so their job is as innovators 
to actually challenge that. Uh, this was a regulation was true for, let's say, 40 years ago, 20, maybe even five years ago, but not anymore. And they have a business case working with uh, their advisors and with uh, their uh, future clients. As a matter of fact, they always need to work with the future client up front to see, is this something you would use? And how is it going to impact you from your regulation perspective? So my answer is from day one, I would even say from day zero, the moment you have this idea and then you understand it's a regulated area, regulation should ever, never stop the innovator to do what he wants to do or she wants to do. Instead, educated plan, educated way of understanding what regulations are here now, uh, and even uh, potentially to see what the, regulation, the regulators are trying to do next, even that, and then design their product with all this uh, information in, um, considered. So I would put all of this into a risks and regulations list, like what are the risks of my business that regulation may stop? So what am I going to do not to stop? Same thing is investor. If I'm an investor and I you know, walk into um, a conversation with the CEO and I know it's a regulated, so what is your plan about regulation? Uh, so, And I would expect they have a better plan how they are going to overcome the issues and what are they going to do with the capital that they are asking for, how to mitigate that risk and to have a growth plan. So... Thank you. And that leads us to the next question is, what sh do you think a founder of a startup do, um, do differently or um, as they become more aware of the regulatory risks? We have a special uh, phrase, uh, strong mm -hmm. CEO yes. and not so strong CEO. And the strength, there are multiple layers, personal strength, team building strength, industry knowledge strength, technical strength, but more importantly, the growth strategy understanding strength. Uh, and if they just think about and they fell in love with their product, which is great, they need to, right? we need to see that passion that they believe in their product. Uh, but at the same time, we expect that that CEO understands the associated risks which should not stop them. Instead, we would like to say, well, there is a risk, but I have a mitigation plan. There is this issue, but we are planning to solve this way. So the CEO, uh, the strong CEO, which will become a successful CEO because they have a plan how to overcome issues that they are coming on their way. Uh, and they, when they know about them up front, they actually plan for them. It becomes like a more of an implementation plan with uh, risks you cover, instead of saying we have obstacles, regulation is stopping me. Well, uh, regulation was there before you started, but then you are in this innovation space and kudos to you to change it. Uh, so regulation, uh, some regulations changed over time and some regulations, if they didn't change, they made exceptions. And if some regulations didn't change, didn't make exceptions, but then you are able to kind of build in your solution that it doesn't go against it, innovative way of addressing the issue. So it sounds like you have given tremendous amount of weight to the aligning and aligning of the speed of innovation with impact and timeline and the role of the CEO. Would you elaborate on those? Um, areas of how to align, like to, how does a CEO go about aligning the company and its product, um, however innovative it may be, aligning it with impact because impact is related to regulatory uh, pathways to approval and to the timeline and massive market penetration of the product. Sure. So CEOs... Uh with their innovation, when they come up with the new ways of doing things, uh, what the advice today is because we are in this fast growing environment, it is growing fast. Uh, you need to align your speed of 
growth with things that are happening around you. So understanding what is happening in the industry that you are in, how things are moving fast. So aligning first with your own industry is number one. And that alignment is based on the regulations, of course. Uh, and it, that alignment is based also on the uh, on the product itself. Like if you put in a product, uh, let's say for biotech, mm -hmm. uh, biotech products require much deeper testing. So testing requires a long time. There was this understanding everything has to be tested like 7, 10, 15. I mean, the numbers were higher. Uh, with, with this pandemic, we learned that certain things can be done faster and how they can be done faster. We actually, in our portfolio, have two companies that they are offering how to make the uh, testing process faster. You don't need seven years. You, know, you need actually the one or two years, depending on the product. So now innovators, bravo to them. Now they are building up solutions to say this can be done faster in a highly regulated space where you can actually test things using AI, uh, using a repetitive uh, functionality, and uh, automating it. So that means uh, you don't need 10,000 uh, patients to, uh, to test it, but you create a sample of patients and then you start multiplying and then show the results that this may happen. So there are many new techniques. Uh, the answer is, the CEO need, uh, can find out what's out in the industry and how. Uh, what are the new techniques that already exist and use them. And what we also promote is uh, collaboration with uh, within industries, even startups collaborating with each other, uh, with the, coming up with different solutions. But actually, they are helping each other to penetrate that product, uh, that uh, the market. So one new trend is startups collaborating. Uh, competition is, is uh, collaboration with competition, believe it or not, uh, because collectively you can actually uh, propose something and then win that case and come up with an exception. Uh, so that helps a lot, the connectivity of startups. Uh, working with uh, companies as channel partners versus just a customer, which means uh, just gaining one customer. Uh, this is answering your question, aligning with the uh, with the growth. So if yeah. you're in a very highly regulated uh, in, uh, industry and the product takes time to uh, take to market, you plan up front the customers that you're targeting as, as you are gaining the penetration with regulation. You build up your base, uh, working and explaining to them, uh, and then also helping them to take your product to others, their channel partners. So channel partnership is the key in that it's just got a really more um, famous or more adaptable in the past two years. So companies, startups that come to our pitches saying that I have two channel partner clients and their their market is this and they're going to take our product to 15 more companies uh, saying that we are using it, you should use it too. Uh, and we call those companies have unfair advantage oh <laughs> that means unfair. unfair advantage compared to other companies or startups mm -hmm. because now you have a partnership that is not that easy to replicate even if they come faster with their innovation even they got the regulatory covered now they have to penetrate the market it will take them longer compared to the other product that already has lined up 40, 50 customers because of their channel partner. So they may show much faster growth. And there is this frustration that some people say, my product is better, but they are not buying it. That is the reason because they had the connections. They showed the value. The other one may have better value, but you show your value. And uh, based on that, you, you penetrate the market. Now, the other competitors may catch up, may do it. But then this smart CEO who was able to get channel partnership, they have to think about their product roadmap. What's next to keep up with the competition? So in this case, for the CEO who is able to use a channel partnership, um, do they always increase the value of the company, do you think? Uh, yes. Well, the first they had to be able to get those channel partners with the value proposition. 
um, the, that is assuming that their product is working, their product is bringing value, their product is saving money, their product is making their people's uh, jobs better, uh, or in the biotech space, uh, they are helping to say uh, to solve some long long-lasting, long-term issues that people couldn't solve before. Uh, so they are offering some new solutions that makes uh, things better for doctors, for patients, for uh, hospitals, and in general, uh, for the health or the wealth of the, uh, the health of the uh, people. Uh, so there is value um, and continuously value has to sustain itself and the other uh, matrix that we have for the company to be successful is the retention of their customers. So the usually one of the first questions we ask, okay, you have those many customers. How many, what is the percentage of your retention? Uh, if they got your product, did they continue using it? That answers directly your question. How would they keep up with this uh, unfair advantage if their product doesn't bring value? So yes, that is the important question to ask and we do ask and that's usually uh, part of the data room documentation they have to have some matrix to show uh, the retention of their customers and thank you for that and do you think there is a special value that investors would put on companies and their products kind of a premium value for positive impact for society and do you think that is necessarily a metric that you can put a number to like 5x exit evaluation is 10x um, compared to a non-impactful product how do you view those well that's my on my to-do list and on my wish list uh, because uh, the value proposition uh, has to have a high and positive impact on the society on the company on the uh, group of people and it goes down to all the way uh, to the individual level. Uh, as of today, I don't think that's a practice that is happening. The multipliers are usually connected to the revenue, mm -hmm. to the uh, income and uh, to the growth uh, in the money uh, where the companies are operating. So right now the multipliers in the market of the VCs and all of the uh, innovation accelerators, incubators, everything. The valuation is mainly uh, based on the growth of the company in dollar amounts. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it's only for some uh, industries uh, and only by multifamily offices, uh, not that they are increasing the value of the company or make a valuation decision. They just decide, uh, do I want to invest in this or not? So that's the decision they make. Uh, but again, the high impact to the positive impact to the people, it's not increasing the valuation, but that's something I would uh, recommend. I would actually start talking more about it. Uh, we were talking about it. Um, and as of right now, it's not a practice, but it's something should be there, which will help with regulations which means when people are trying to do something wrong, regulation is not the only way to manage it. It's long-term, it's very difficult. It actually, uh, some people shy away because of re uh, re regulations to enter that market, which is not good because they can help with their innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, if, but if we add, uh, in addition to revenue so far, and then later on, maybe we can switch completely. But if we add the impact of uh, the uh, calculate the valuation based on the positive impact they make on society, I think with that, we are helping not to create additional or unnecessary or difficult regulations. We just help CEOs to say, well, am I doing something good? And if I'm not, they're not going to give me money or they're not going to give me too much money or the one that I'm asking. So right now it's the valuation is based on revenue and that's what all the CEOs are concentrated. We are asking those questions, but moving forward because technology impact is so high, it can bring all the harm and it can bring all the good. So we wanna control the harming part. And when most of the time, that's why regulations are late. 
They come after things have happened. There is a damage has been made. But if at the beginning with the investors, we evaluate, evaluate the company with the positive impact, I think that will be a revolutionary change. Thank you. So given the experience you've had in the tech industry, do you share parallels or see parallels between the tech industry and the biotech industry um, in terms of regulations that could be improved or steps to improve dialogue between regulators and innovators? Well, biotech by itself, I'm glad to say that biotech means it's a uh, biological technology. So it's great that we have biotech. Mm -hmm. And then technology itself. So biotech is a technology that is specifically uh, targeting uh, biological innovation in biology. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we go that path, that means technology is already in. That means biology is also in. So that's that merge has happened, which was a phenomenal good uh, change for the humanity. Now, um, the impact of uh, the regulations in technology, again, uh, depending on what are you impacting, if you're impacting a software, definitely it's a different, uh, it's a different uh, regulation. But you're impacting a human's life, uh, that's a different one. And if you're impacting animal life, it's different. You're mm -hmm. impacting environment or climate, it's different. Uh, so depending on that, uh, regulations will still be a little bit um, harsh on uh, biotech versus the software tech. But because our human body is becoming a software, that line is getting smaller and smaller. So biotech itself is becoming technology. Uh, which means regulations apply to both, which means the software is now being used to change the DNA or change a uh, disease in somebody's body, add it out or cut it out or add or revise it, uh, all these things. So uh, now technology is all the way into the biology. Uh, and now I would actually say tech bio versus biotech. Uh, so that is already happening. Uh, and. Uh, I am excited about it if it's uh, in good hands. So that's why CEOs, when we invest, when I invest, I really pay attention to CEO and the team they have uh, surrounded themselves. Because where you take that biotech or where you take your innovation is really based on the CEO values themselves as a person. Are you going to take it to the level that you just make money and then kill so many people, but you've made money? Or you stop somewhere and say, I will not do this. It's just because their values, not only company value and valuation, but their own personal. So uh, with that, I would say regulations should be attempted to make in the education level that we build people with values. It comes down to who is going to do the harm? The person. The robot is not going to do it. They're going to be programmed by a person. Uh, so the technology is there. The innovation is there. What will change is if we put a lot of attention to the values of the CEO. So right now we, we invest in companies First and foremost, when I see the CEO uh, is a solid person, knowledgeable, is passionate, knows what they are doing, has the plan to take his company all the way to the exit. They're not going to stop no matter what. They will just re request advice and more capital to continue their journey. And uh, personally for me, I also pay attention to the uh, personal values and the way they treat their team, the way they treat us as investors, and the way they a plan to grow. It comes across very quickly. So certainly it's not there all the time, but there is that trend that people want to pay more deep attention to technology. How is it being used by these uh, founders and their teams? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You answered actually one of my questions. This is how strongly do you believe that innovators are responsible for building 
you know, very healthy, impactful product and inf- in innovation where people really benefit. It's not just to make money. Um, of course, that's important. So perhaps for anyone who is thinking about approaching your fund, um, what what do you think a CEO or a group of startup founders should know about working with an investor like yourself? Well, we start working with, uh, we work with companies that are in a seed round, which means they finish their idea stage. Uh, They work with some advisors and uh, some network of people or companies uh, to develop their uh, minimum viable product. And now uh, they have been approached the market, did some market fit exercise, and they come and ask for more capital. Now they are ready to grow. So we work with growth companies and the expectations from these CEOs that we have, men and women both, uh, and small teams or large teams both, uh, we expect to have uh, the understanding that they believe in their product. So the belief is very important. Not that they just want to do it because they can, but uh, what is the belief that it's going to have an impact? And then... All the CEOs, as a matter of fact, it's been now four or five years that the CEOs are very uh, savvy. They do good market research. They say, this is my percentage. This Before it wasn't there. Now it's very good. It's actually very helpful to see how they do research. But more importantly, uh, the impact, usually we say, don't sell me technology. And as a matter of fact, this is all VCs. This is the message. Tell me what it means to, what this product means to your customers. Show me the value proposition. Show me the business model, not technical solution, because that's your part. You do your technical side. But you tell me, once you have it, what is the impact? Uh, We have uh, one of our presenters, actually, one of our uh, speakers in our program. We have also an educational program. It's called BAJ Accelerator uh, Program. Uh, we, uh, We have this messaging, like, do not sell me plain parts. Show me the plane, but then say this plane, you're going to be able to fly with this plane. So what we are asking CEOs to show what it means to your customers, whatever you're doing, and how it's going to help them to live better, to live healthier, uh, to do things faster, to, uh, to get smarter, uh, to add uh, to add that to their some other things that they are doing. So, what is the uh, value to your customers? I think you will hear this from more VCs. Uh, technical solution. They say, oh, but we'll look at it when we are doing due diligence. Right now, you tell me what is the value to your customers. Thank you. So, if an innovator is um, looking for advice at this point time in history um, what would you offer them um, someone is thinking about developing a novel say healthcare app for general use and wellness maintenance for example and they come to ask you about a, you know how should we approach the product uh, what are some of the common advice that you would offer the first question very good question by the way Uh, First of all, I will say before I go into my answer, please innovate. Uh, Do not stop yourself. If your brain is uh, towards that, you you need to absolutely continue. So the question we usually ask is, what problem are you solving? If there is no problem to solve, no matter how great your website, your product, or your service will be, People will not need it. So it's not the harsh market. It's not even the regulation. It's not the certification. It's not the price. People just don't need it. So the question we usually ask, are you solving a problem that is urgent, immediate, Mm -hmm. or nice to have? Mm -hmm. The urgent matter problems that people have immediately, uh, they will look into that solution immediately. Mm -hmm. The problems that are nice to have, it's hard to sell. That's why you have 50-50. You just do so much work, nobody's buying, and you get frustrated thinking that it's the regulation or something else. Uh, so it's very important also to target uh, who. Who are you targeting? 
Mm -hmm. uh, the audience that is underserved systemically and you're offering something that nobody's paying attention uh, or you're looking into a problem that everybody knows about, nobody just has time for it. You, now you're making that important for you uh, because it's nice to have, they don't want to do it uh, or they think it's not time to do it. So the question is, uh, what problem are you solving? For who? And what type of problem is it? Is it urgent, nice to have, or um, uh, it, it's important to have? Thank you. Yeah. Um, as I am from the biotech and pharma industry, I have one last question before we close the session right uh, today. And that is, if you could stand in front of the FDA, given what has happened in the past two years um, with COVID and innovation around COVID vaccines and therapeutics, what would you tell the FDA? Well, first of all, um, uh, FDA is going through some transformation themselves uh, because there was a good uh, aha moment to show that uh, things can be done differently. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, as COVID is as painful and uh, tragic was, for many families, many people, many countries, many regions, uh, it was very painful. We had so many uh, lost lives. Uh, at the same time, it actually pushed so many limits that were going slow because it was okay, comfortable, but it actually pushed so many limits to look at, at things differently. One of them was the healthcare industry, the regulations, mm -hmm. and uh, the way we uh, treat certain things and the healthcare industry in general in all countries. Everybody had their own pros and cons, but in general, there was a non-readiness to take care of this kind of a pandemic, which we learned a uh, hard way. Uh, so FDA is going through changes. So we should take that moment and uh, actually seize that moment, that opportunity to say, what can I do differently to approach FDA with my messaging? Uh, the messaging could be, uh, this will solve this problem. So FDA needs to see exactly what problem this new solution is solving. And then uh, probably saying, why is it solving faster, cheaper, uh, or the impact is much higher with such small capital. Uh, so FDA uh, would look into those problems fast and urgently mm -hmm. if you prove that this is an urgent problem to solve. So we went back right. to my right. earlier question. Uh, I think the urgency is what really um, regulators, um, even clients, like if you approach a client and say, I know you're losing this much money and it's on top of your list to solve, I'm here to solve it. Regardless of who you are and you have unfair advantage or not, they're going to say, okay, tell me what it is. And then you better be prepared to answer some questions exactly how you're going to help them to solve that urgent problem. So urgency is what will gain FDA's attention and some unique way of doing it um, if it's cheaper, better. If it's not, it's okay. But at least you say, uh, I'm solving this urgent problem. Thank you. Yeah, I think given time, um, we're going to thank you for all your wonderful advice and comments. And I hope everyone who um, will be approaching you uh, watches this video first to learn about who you are and how passionate you are about building businesses that have lasting positive impact on society. And I want to thank you for your time um, and hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference at Horace's USA today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.